Welcome to the Faithful and True Podcast. We're happy to bring to you another legacy podcast from the Men of Valor program featuring Dr. Mark Laser and myself. We're going to do a podcast series that is based on the three spiritual questions. These uh, principles come from Mark's original book, Becoming a Man of Valor. Here now is Dr. Mark Laser. Well, Mark, when we we left our listeners last week, uh, we had uh, introduced them to the second spiritual uh, question uh, that uh, all of this information, by the way, comes from Mark's book, Becoming a Man of Valor. And uh, not to be uh, self-promotional, but I thought I would mention it in passing because it was brought up uh, by someone via email. Uh, The last couple of weeks, Mark has been talking about the three spiritual questions, and these are really discussed in in length in Mark's book called Becoming a Man of Valor. And also, uh, any of our alumni from our workshops who are listening would know that these are the spiritual questions that we begin every morning with uh, at our workshop. So uh, for some of the men, it you know may be slightly redundant to hear these again, but on the other hand, uh, uh, given the fact that uh, we, we say and we teach that the uh, spiritual questions should be ones that we ask ourselves every morning, I, I think it's uh, not a bad thing to remind ourselves of what they are. We are going to get in now to the uh, third spiritual question, and it's really one of the the longer ones, it's a little bit uh, not more difficult, but I think it requires some uh, deeper explanation. Um, and as I usually do, I, I, I like to kind of get into wherever I'm at or whatever I'm teaching based on, you know, things that have been uh, going on in my life recently. And this past uh, Saturday night, it was the Saturday after uh, Thanksgiving and uh some of our relatives were in town, and that included uh, uh, my wife's parents, uh, otherwise known as my in-laws, otherwise known as uh, Ben's grandparents. And uh, uh, on Sunday, my father-in-law turned 93 years old. If he knew that I was talking about this on the radio, he would shoot me. But fortunately, he's back in uh, Chicago at the moment. Uh, but we went to a play uh, at one of our theaters here in the uh, Twin Cities. It's called the History Theater, and they generally devote all their productions to some kind of historical event. And this particular show, they were featuring uh, the Andrews sisters, uh, three women at least, who were uh, uh, doing a, an excellent job of uh, sounding very much like uh, the Andrews sisters, you know, uh, the Boogie Woogie Bu- Bugle Boy Bugle Company Boy, B Company mm-hmm. B and all of that. They, they did an excellent job, but the show was set on um, Christmas Eve, uh, 1944, and uh, that was a interesting time. Obviously, the uh, tide of the war uh, seemed like it might be turning because of the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, we ev- we eventually know how that uh, obviously turned out, and it was uh, finally in April of 19. Uh, 45 that the uh, war in Europe was uh, concluded but that that Christmas was a was a very uh, conflicted difficult time a key moment and uh, one of the things they did during the show uh, which I thought was very moving was uh, uh, the women playing the Andrews sisters there therefore the Andrews sisters uh, had all of the men in the audience who had uh, I I still get emotional thinking about it. Of course. Uh, Served during World War II. uh, Stand up. And uh, they actually brought several of them up on stage and and, uh, danced with them to, you know, one of their jive type numbers. Sure. And uh, it was quite moving. Uh, There was, I'm guessing, maybe 20 men in that audience uh, that uh, had served in World War II. And you know, after the show, we were talking. I was, I was, uh, you know, again asking my father-in-law the question about some of the things that he had done during the war. And uh, uh, one of the things that he had done, uh, he flew a plane. He was uh, with the artillery. It's too long a story. But uh, he flew forward observation for the ar- artillery in a single-engine plane, and he would observe where the shells were landing and radio back to the, to the gunners, uh, you know, uh, how to correct their uh, trajectory so that they would hit their targets. Uh, and as he's gotten older, like a lot of the veterans, I think he's getting a little bit more honest about, uh, you know, how dangerous it was. And he was involved, as it turns out, in the Battle of the Bulge. The uh, the group that he was with was directly involved in that fight. So uh, 
the reason I'm bringing this up is the third spiritual question uh, really centers around uh, what attitude we need to have in order to uh, be the, the men that God calls us to be. And uh, it seems to me that that is uh, an attitude of sacrifice. Uh, the, the men that I work with who have gotten themselves involved in, in uh, lots of addictive activity, we would have to say at every level that what they're doing is uh, uh, incredibly selfish. And so what is the opposite of selfish, if not the word selfless? So therefore, then the question becomes, what would a what would be something that people should think about in terms of if they wanted to look at in themselves their own attitude of selflessness? And uh, then this third spiritual question comes up in my mind. What would be the the absolute final act of selflessness? And that would be a willingness to die for something. Mm -hmm. And so the third spiritual question is, what, in fact, would you be willing to die for? And uh, the reason that that prompted that that story about the the show with the Andrews sisters, you know, World War II, 1944, Battle of the Bulge, my father-in-law, is that, you know, I've, I've never heard uh, my father-in-law, any of the veterans, uh, my own father, who's been, been dead now since uh, 2005, also uh, was in the European theater with the 101st Airborne Division. And uh, uh, I'd never heard them talk about... Uh, that it was a huge sacrifice, you know, that uh, they didn't want to go. Uh, they uh, they all signed up, uh, you know, uh, they interrupted uh, their lives, their careers. Uh, uh, my father-in-law, after graduating from uh, college, had to postpone marriage uh, to go and serve for several years. Uh, my father interrupted uh, uh, his college career and, uh, you know, the same kind of story. Uh, they got on boats. They 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 did what they need to do and uh, needed to do. And obviously, uh, many of them did not come back. And you know, and paid that ultimate right. price. Uh, <clears throat> the reason that's interesting to me, Randy, and and uh, you're not quite as old as I am, but I think you're old enough to remember uh, the days of uh, the Vietnam period when. Uh, uh, my generation, you know, the baby boomers. So we are the product of these guys that went over and served in World War II. Or it's just like Tom Brokaw refers to that that specific group as the greatest generation. That, that's right. And uh, uh, they came home finally in 1946. A lot of them got married. And uh, and the baby boom started in 1946, strangely enough. Right. Uh, right. So uh, some of us are the product of that. So we we would hear about and know that you know our fathers served in uh, World War II. But then when the the major conflict of our day came around, you know, which was the the Vietnamese War. Uh, uh, if you'll remember, and, and some of the listeners, I'm guessing, are too young to remember. They they maybe have read about this in their history books, but you know it was a tremendously conflicted time. It was right. a, a time in which <clears throat> a lot of people did not believe in the uh, uh, the uh, purpose of that war. They they thought that America was being war mongering. They thought we were interfering in places we shouldn't be. And you know we the flag was burned, draft cards were burned. People were coming up with various excuses to avoid the draft. Uh, and returning soldiers were, were not being welcomed home. That's right. In fact, I talked to a guy uh, who's a, a client who, you know, my age and returned from Vietnam, and he remembers stepping off the plane in San Francisco uh, and uh, getting spit on uh, by some people for, you know, the supposedly horrendous things he had done over in Vietnam. So, you know, it was a terrible time myself. Uh, we all had draft numbers, you know. We all, uh, you know, sat around my college union, uh, waiting to see what our draft number was going to be. And uh, if uh, some of my fraternity brothers got low draft numbers, and they started planning how they were going to get out of it, uh, I was going to seminary. And back in those days, uh, going to seminary was an automatic deferment. And I will tell you this, Randy: when I got to seminary in 1971, 
uh, it was a very strange class. I, I mean, there were a lot of guys that weren't necessarily called by God to go into ministry. There was a bunch of guys that were called by the draft, and so they decided to go to seminary to, to get, get out, out of, of the it. draft. Right. The point I'm trying to make is that my generation did not always have that same attitude that our father's generation has. I uh, was reminiscing about you know, my generation, the greatest generation, uh, the product of the greatest generation, uh, the, us baby boomers, and the fact that when we went through our uh, opportunities to serve, it, it was generally not considered to be an honorable thing to do or a, a valuable thing to do. And that attitude kind of remained in the country for a long time. And uh, I noticed a, a huge shift, uh, obviously, right after uh, 911, uh, because our, our attitudes about the military had been uh, what they were in the 70s and so forth. And uh, it really took our own country getting attacked uh, to uh, begin to shift that. And uh, obviously, right after that, I noticed that uh, you could be on planes, you could be various places, and people started uh, appreciating um, the military. Members of the military, right. And uh, these days, you know, on uh, Veterans Day, Memorial Day, we have, you know, uh, veterans... Uh, stand up. Uh, we thank them. We're encouraged to thank them. Um, on the on the way to the office this morning, uh, on the radio, I was hearing about the death of one of our local Marines who died a couple days ago uh, in Afghanistan. So, and uh, there's some guy from Illinois driving to put up 2,000 flags along the uh, funeral uh, processional route uh, tomorrow. So we're, we're doing things now to honor the military, and uh, it's become something that we value again. And as we get into this question, uh, when I am teaching men about this question, I, I like to start with a question that is, uh, helps them to kind of get into it, and that is, would you die for your country? And, uh, you know, all of the men pretty much these days, the younger men say, yeah, yeah, they would. I mean, given the opportunity, given the uh, the chance to serve, you know, they, they would. Uh, that, that's something that's being valued. We, we understand that. We see the global conflicts. We see the various crises around the world. We, we understand that the causes of freedom are being challenged. And I think uh, the average man and certainly woman these days, you know, could answer that question. I think, don't you uh, think, as you mentioned a moment ago, uh, 9-11 really reignited that fire within most Americans. Yeah, and, and one of the things about that was that we, uh, we began to see the, the acts of sacrifice that happened even on that day. Right. Uh, the, uh, the, the firefighters, the paramedics, uh, the various uh, police policemen mm -hmm. that, that uh, you know, at risk of their lives, and some of them lost their lives, you know, uh, trying to serve, going back into the building. One of my favorite examples is a a Catholic priest who, uh, whose, uh, whose diocese included several of the fire departments, uh, and uh, he, he considered that, that it was you know, his congregation, the firemen that were going back into you know, one of the towers, and so he went back in with them, and uh, he actually was casualty number one that was identified uh, because the firemen, seeing that he had been crushed by some falling debris, carried him back to his church and laid him at the altar at his church. Mm -hmm. uh, we began to see those stories. And then, of course, the, the guys on the plane uh, in Pennsylvania. And so we, we all got the idea of sacrifice. I remember getting on the, uh, the plane the first time after that event and, and, and thinking in a somewhat grandiose way, you know, let someone try to mess with the with my right. plane. I, right. I'd seen Harrison Ford in that, <laughs> in that Air movie, Force One. Air Force One. Mm -hmm. So, but, you know, let's keep going here because the, the question is a, is a deep one about sacrifice and selflessness. Uh, I, I asked the guys at this point, you know, after I said, would you die for the, your country? And they all get kind of rah-rah about that. Uh, then I asked them, would you die for your children? Well, that's also an easy one. You know, if they have children, they... They, of course, say, yeah, obviously we would. I mean, if we had uh, the uh, opportunity, chance, cause, whatever it was, to trade places, sacrifice for, give them a kidney, whatever it would be, uh, you know, we would do that. Uh, but then I ask the men uh, that come to our workshops here a more difficult question, I think, 
uh, and that is, uh, would you die for your wife? And whenever I ask that part of the question, there is a pause. You know, the, the first two parts of that, would you die for your country, would you die for your child? Oh, yes, uh, amen, absolutely, no problem. Then would you die for your wife? And there's, a, there's just a brief pause. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like I could hear some of them say, well, uh, uh, wait a minute, uh, do, you, do you know my wife? Uh, you know, do you know some of the things she's done or hasn't done? You know, that kind of stuff. And uh, what's interesting to me about the question is that uh, those of us that have ever committed sexual infidelity or sin, you know, uh, chances are we've excused it at some level. We've rationalized it. We've uh, minimized it because of... Uh, perceptions that we have about the status of our uh, relationship. Let's just put it that way. Uh, we can get critical of this or that. And uh, I think those people that commit infidelity, there's at least a part of them that is angry, whether it be at their spouse, at, at other people, their parents, God, whoever it is. And so what we're trying to do in this spiritual question is kind of try to turn it around and say, uh, what is our calling in life, really, when God calls us into marriage? Uh, and we can go through a variety of scriptures. Uh, <clears throat> I, you know, think of you know Paul's writing in Ephesians uh, chapter five, where he starts out by saying that we're all to to lead a life of love, just as Christ loved the church. And what did Christ do? Gave himself up for the church. Paul says a fragrant offering a sacrifice. It's, it's after that introduction that he goes on to talk about how husbands and wives should serve each other. And then after that, he concludes by saying, uh, repeating the words of Jesus, who is repeating the words of the writer of Genesis, uh, that says, when a man and a woman come together, they become, what, one flesh. And when we're called into a one flesh union, um, I think the biblical intention is that, that that's not so that we can get all of our selfish needs met. That is so that we have yet another opportunity to serve and to love and to be an imitator of Christ in the way that, that he loved the church. In fact, Paul, at the end of that passage, talks about the fact that when he's talking about marriage, he is in fact talking about the relationship of Christ in the church. So... For those that are married, for those that are contemplating tonight looking at pornography on the Internet, uh, please know that you know looking at other women when your wife wants to be the only woman in your life, that is, in fact, killing her spirit. Uh, if you're contemplating, and some of our listeners out there uh, will be, you know, there's, there's some woman at the office who's uh, paid him a little bit extra attention, uh, met at the... Uh, uh, water cooler, the coffee pot, the or they've had to, they've been sent on a trip, uh, you know, by the company together to some distant place, and and this this person is treating you more nicely than uh, you're being treated at home, and so you're facing that temptation. You know, I think that this uh, this third spiritual question is, are you willing at that point? Not to give in to the temptation to what would be a selfish act, but are you willing to do something that is selfless? Are you willing to uh, die for your wife at that point? And there may be, part of this question is, there may be attitudes inside you uh, that need to die. Attitudes of selfishness or anger or that kind of thing. Mark, is it your opinion then that uh, last week you introduced our listeners to uh, the seven desires of every heart. Right. And uh, is there selfishness based in some of those desires not being met? Well, I think that can lead to selfishness. In other words, if you perceive uh, your, your interpretation of life and its events and your relationships is that there are no people in your life that are listening to you, that are affirming you, that are loving you unconditionally, that are touching you in healthy and sexual ways. You know, you can get to that place of anger and resentment. Mm -hmm. And uh, anger and resentment is the seedbed of any of the sins that we commit. Uh, when we perceive that our legitimate needs and desires are not getting met. Is that kind of the basis of most addicts' rationalization for their acting out? 
Yeah, it's the shuns, the rationalizations, the explanations, the minimizations, you know, all of those shuns. You know, there, every addict uh, or every person who commits an act of infidelity, let's say, has had to somehow have a conversation in their brain about why it's okay to do these things. Particularly if they're a, a Christian, they're going to have to somehow rationalize why it's okay to do the things that they're doing. So uh, what, what we teach here is something that we find to be biblically consistent, and, and that goes back to this third spiritual question, and that is if you pay attention to serving the desires of others... The strange part of that is that it becomes a paradox. When you start serving others, they will start serving you back. Mm -hmm. and, and by giving and by sacrificing, chances are you will get back those things which you so desperately desire. Not to mention the fact that, of course, uh, Psalm 37 reminds us, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will, in fact, give you the desires of your heart. So we should turn to God first for all of those. So uh, as we wrap up uh, t today's show, what questions would you like to leave our listeners with this week? Well, one of the interesting things about these uh, three shows that we're just wrapping up today about the three spiritual questions is that the main question today is, in fact, that third spiritual question. I'd, I'd like the listeners just to sit down, take 5, 10, 15 minutes, maybe jot down, write on a piece of paper, journal if you want to. Who is it in your life that you would be willing to die for? If that situation arose, uh, as unlikely as it might be, uh, who are you willing to serve in your life? Who would you be willing to sacrifice for? Ultimately, who would you be willing to die for? That is a deep question. People don't like thinking about death, so it's a hard one to ponder. But uh, that's what I'm challenging the listeners to think about. Well, thank you for listening. We hope that you have enjoyed and benefited from these great teachings of Mark's. If you find yourself struggling with sexual addiction or sexual uh, purity issues or pornography addiction, we invite you to visit faithfulandtrue.com where you'll find many resources and more importantly, access to our Men's Journey Workshop. There on the website, you'll learn all about the workshop and have the opportunity to register right online. We bring you the Men's Journey Workshop every month, and we hope that if you're struggling with these issues, that you'll seriously consider attending one of our workshops. Until then, we hope that this has been a meaningful and beneficial podcast for you, and we hope that the coming week will be filled with many blessings and great vision. <music>